Great. I'm back. Ladies and gentlemen, I have to tell you where I live. No one knows where Vermont is, and so I live in this little state, which is right here in the northeast. The population of my whole state is 630,000 people, which is, I think, kind of amazing when I come to India. What it's famous for is tourism and beautiful scenery. So this is what you would see if you came to my state. This would be a very typical fall scene. People travel from all over the United States to come see our colors. And this is what you would see if you come in the winter. Uh, I encourage you to want to see snow, come see where I live. Okay. Excuse me. So ladies and gentlemen, we're going to talk about type 2 diabetes and my thoughts on what that disease is. I'm going to start with this recent publication talking about the incidence of diabetes worldwide. It's relevant for me because as you see this starts in the year 1980 and I actually started my endocrine training in the year 1980. So from 1980 until present you can see there's been a 400 percent increase in the incidence of worldwide diabetes with uh, one of the places which has very much affected this part of the world. This slide actually tells you something about why. It's partly from growth in population, it's partly from better screening, but it's also partly from a changing natural history of the disease and that makes up about 25 percent of the growth over the last uh, 25 years and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Oops. So really from the late, 19, uh, late 20th century until the present, there's been an enormous amount of interest in trying to understand what this disease is. We talk about it in terms of insulin resistance versus islet dysfunction, and in fact there's been a lot of research trying to understand the relationships between those two, when they occur, what they really are. Um, this is the kind of teaching slide we use in the United States. It's overly simplistic, but it's really helped our providers understand the important relationships between those two parameters. And what it shows is yes, very early in the course of this illness there is marked uh, issues related to insulin resistance and also beta cell compensation, but when we start to think about what is behind the progression of the disease onto prediabetes and then full-blown type 2 diabetes, it tells us the beta cell really plays a central role. Now this is just kind of a cartoon that we might show in a CME presentation, but in fact I want to show you some real data to support that because it becomes important in this discussion. This is one of my favorite publications. It's a publication from the United States of a very high risk ethnic group for type 2 diabetes. And in the study they took a total of 58 individual or 48 individuals who were all normally glucose tolerant at the beginning beginning of the study and they were followed for five years and they were followed with major parameters of both insulin sensitivity and beta cell function. Now what's important in this study is a third of the individuals went on to diabetes and two thirds didn't. So you can compare the two groups and learn sort of a lot about the natural differences between them. And that's what's shown here. What we're looking at is a relationship between uh, insulin sensitivity on the x-axis and beta cell function as determined by insulin response to a, an acute glucose challenge on the y-axis. And this is the normal relationship between the two, the disposition index. So what you see will first start look at the people, the two-thirds of the individuals who didn't go on to diabetes. This is an obese population, quite an insulin resistant population, but what you can see is they didn't go on to diabetes because they have perfect compensation in terms of their insulin secretion. Really an amazing relationship between the two, just perfect. But now when we start to look at the individuals who went on to diabetes, now you see the clear pattern of worsening beta cell function as opposed to much in the way of changing insulin sensitivity. So a drop to prediabetes and a further drop with full-blown type 2 diabetes. The kind of data which has been demonstrated in numerous publications and in numerous ethnic groups, really pointing out the importance of the beta cell in this disease. And so the last 20 or 30 years has had a big focus on trying to understand what are the molecular and physiological mechanisms behind the worsening beta cell function in this disease. And in fact, I've run a basic laboratory of beta cell biology for most of my professional life interested in that subject. 
And what you see here is a listing of many of the mechanisms which are linked to potential beta cell dysfunction and loss of beta cells in this disease, a list related on direct or indirect uh, effects of the hyperglycemia, including metabolic stresses with ER stress, oxidative stress, and also a variety of other mechanisms. Now, I'm particularly interested in ER stress, and I'll show you why. This is a study that we've done in rodents recently of doing high fat feeding in rodents. And what I want to simply show you is, I think, interesting data that's uh, easy to see. What we're looking at is gene expression changes in the islands over a full 16 weeks of fat feeding. Important beta cell function genes, important transcription factors affecting both beta cell function and beta cell growth mechanisms, and also genes associated with endoplasmic reticulum. The green shows an increased expression of a gene, and the pink shows a falling expression of the gene. So what you can see in these mice when you just give them a nice fat diet so that they uh, are very happy and get fat over 16 weeks, initially there is profound beta cell compensation, both functionally and growth of beta cell mass, but continued with time, that compensation and hyperexpression fails so that they transition to reduction in important genes regulating function, reduction in important genes regulating beta cell mass, and now the advent of key genes associated with the onset of endoplasmic reticulum stress. So really a dynamic pattern moving from compensation to failure in ER stress. And you can actually see that in an electron micrograph of a beta cell from these mice. This is what a healthy beta cell looks like with all the granules, beautiful mitochondria and endoplasmic reticulum. And this is what the micrograph looks like in the mice who've been receiving fat. The uh, endoplasmic reticulum is very dilated. The mitochondria look unhealthy and they're swollen. And this is beginning evidence for cells that will eventually fail and die. But having said that, that is a single mechanism. And there are powerful research groups all over the world who have studied different mechanisms here and have beautiful data to support that all of these occur in people with type 2 diabetes. Now, it's possible that individual people express individual defects, or it's possible that all of these defects occur in individuals as their beta cells are failing in this disease. I'm a believer in the second. And in fact, my sort of feeling about why we see so many de defects in beta cells in type 2 diabetes, I use the analogy of something called an old car hypothesis. Essentially, if you would buy an old car, if you've ever done that, then you know what happens. First, you have to replace the tires. Then eventually, you have to replace the brakes. And then the battery. Something goes wrong in the motor. And with time, more and more happens because the, the car is just falling apart. And that's sort of my, my concept of what happens to beta cells in type 2 diabetes. By the time people come to see us, especially when they're far enough along in the disease that re they're requiring multiple uh, drugs, their beta cells are sick on multiple levels, not a single level. The importance of this is with all those mechanisms I've pointed out to you, investigators often want to attempt therapies focused on that single defect, and most of those trials are uh, showing minimal, if at all, benefits from that intervention. So what I take away from that with established type 2 diabetes, the kind of uh, patients we see who come into our clinic, beta cells are pretty gone in terms of being able to use a single intervention focused on trying to preserve their function. And that what we really need to do is to develop successful interventions against the earliest stages of beta cell defects in this disease and to identify what they are. So, the obvious research question is, what are the earliest beta cell defects in this disease? 
The reason that I showed you this slide, the reason I like it so much, is not that the data is unique. In fact, there are multiple studies showing fa failing beta cells in type 2 diabetes. But the reason that this study was so notable when it was published, because of this. What people had not appreciated, remember all of these subjects were normally glucose tolerant when they entered the study. But in the people who went on to failure and eventual diabetes, they did not fall on the curve. Already there was evidence of beta cell defects, subclinical, not yet accompanied by hyperglycemia, or at least abnormal glycemia, but clearly inadequate beta cell function for their degree of insulin sensitivity. So something was already wrong at that early stage of the disease. Since then, a number of data have been done to prove that there are subtle but important defects that occur in beta cells long before people move into the pre-diabetes stage where we would have a glucose marker to tell us there's something wrong. These are famous data which come from Ralph DeFranzo and Ellie Farinini, and what they've done is go to a diabetes clinic and taken a large number of individuals with various stages of glycemia. And I want to focus on the people in green who are all normally glucose tolerant. They've had an oral glucose tolerance test, and at two hours we have people who are less than 140, the definition of normal, but here less than 120, and here, here even less than 100, maybe supernormal. What you see is a dramatic, almost 60% reduction in beta cell function in these individuals from a two-hour value of 100 to 140. So clearly there is a dynamic sequence where beta cell function is being lost as people progress through the stage of what we call normal glucose tolerance, and then it even worsens as they go further down. Now, that then leads to the key research question, well, what are the causes of beta cell dysfunction when people are at that early stage, something that we call susceptible beta cells? What does that really mean from a biology point of view? Well, an obvious answer is genetics. And so starting in the year 2007 was the first year that genome-wide association scans were reported. And in fact, the major first major genome-wide association scan in any disease happened to be done in type 2 diabetes in a famous paper. From then until now, there is the identification of almost 200 susceptibility genes. I would tell you in the last year, it's been an eventful year, one paper alone added 110 new susceptibility genes in this disease. So we are not lacking in susceptibility genes. Unfortunately, what we've learned is they're all a very modest effect. Nothing stands out, so we're not using anything clinically in our, uh, in our seeing patients of testing specific genetic mutations. And we started out saying a, years, a few years ago that virtually all the genes were focused within the beta cell. That's no longer true. A number of genes have been found in multiple organs that are associated with this disease, including in the liver and also in insulin sensitivity and adipocyte uh, uh, models. In terms of specifics, we've learned a few things. One of the interesting issues related to genome-wide association scans is you don't start testing a specific gene you're interested in you actually wait to see what loci they give you, and then you say, well, is that something I know something about or is it not? And most of the genes we've come across we didn't really know anything about when they first came to us. The key one, and the one which has had most of the discussion because it has the highest fold risk in type 2 diabetes, is something called transcription factor 7, but that was a cancer gene when that was first identified, and only later has it been shown that this protein plays an important signaling role in beta cells in terms of insulin secretion. A number of other genes have been identified that have taught us a few things. It turns out that, that zinc transport in uh, islets is important because within the insulin granule we have zinc to preserve its cellularity. Oh, what am I doing? What did I do? Excuse me. We'll get there, I promise. <laughs> 
Okay, so the zinc transporter is kind of interesting. It turns out that this gene is, a, that this gene is associated with the ATP-sensitive potassium channel, but again, none of this is really translated into general clinical care for type 2 diabetes, and whether they will translate to be specific targets for future drug therapy is open to some discussion. But having said that, new things are happening in the genetics world that are very interesting. One is we're beginning to identify specific genotypes within ethnic origins. This happens to be in Mexicans, and it turns out that this is an important carboxyl uh, uh, transporter which uh, affects uh, lipid metabolism within the liver. Uh, people have not only looked at specific genes in terms of raising the risk of diabetes, but took a different, uh, a, a different approach and looked for genes that protect against diabetes and learned a little bit. But the hottest topic within the genetic aspect of diabetes world right now are epigenetic factors, not coding changes which promote for diabetes, but coding changes that regulate the expression of that gene by epigenetic factors. And that's shown here. There's a huge biology which regulates the expression of a gene by upstream factors, with one of the most important being methyltransferases, because if you put a methylation with on a gene, it tends to suppress transcription of that gene. And for the gene to be transcribed, we need to have opening up of the histones and really making it uh, available for a transcription, to, a transcription factor to bind onto that genetic material and promote transcription. And there's a large science now related to the regulation of expression of genes and patterns of expression and a lot of information with the di within the diabetes world supporting changes in methylation patterns and other regulation of epigenetics which may be important in susceptibility for this uh, disease. One of the most important is related to malnutrition. And in fact, there are many animal models which support that if you cause malnutrition to newly born rodents, what you will end up doing is to impact beta cell development and beta cell function, which goes lifelong. So if you deprive or change the nutrition of a young rodent until it's weaned and then give it normal food, it will still have susceptibility to obesity and diabetes later in life, which it transmits to the next generation. And so there's a lot of epidemiologic literature in humans and also biological literature in terms of methylation patterns supporting that early childhood mal malnutrition is an important cause for susceptibility for diabetes sometime later. And I point that out because India continues to be a country which struggles with malnutrition in certain parts of the country, and this uh, potentially is a very important cause as you go forward for the, uh, raising in, uh, the incidence of diabetes in this country. Uh, along with epigenetic changes associated with poor nutrition, the other is poor diabetes management in pregnant women, and there are a number of important studies showing that you can look at blood in the mother and cord blood from the fetus and show that metabolic changes associated with poor diabetes control in the mother have the same metabolomic uh, changes in, in the baby, uh, potentially impacting them as they go forward. Now that is not the only interest in terms of other causes of susceptible genes. There's a lot of other major research topics which are ongoing. One is things which are in our foods, monoglycerols being a preservative which are used in foods, have direct beta cell effects when, you, uh, when shown uh, used in vitro. A number of interest in environmental toxins potentially impacting healthy beta cell function and the one currently which is receiving a high level of interest is air pollution, particularly important in many Asian countries. A huge amount of interest in our GI microflora and one of the major research areas this is looked at is to study micro, microflora, the gut microflora in patients with type 2 diabetes before they have bariatric surgery, after they have bariatric surgery with marked weight loss and with now uh, recovery of their diabetes and looking at all of the flora changes which are associated uh, and, how they, and how they impact metabolism 
and a huge research topic which is focused on the brain and central nervous system and how that uh, affects uh, metabolism uh, and peripheral uh, glucose and fat uh, metabolism. So there's a lot of topics here that are being focused on in trying to understand what creates uh, susceptible beta cells. The importance of that is if it was a genetic basis, some genetic mutation, we might be able to use that clinically to screen people and maybe look for drug targets. Not much else we could do about it. Many of these are amenable to major public health uh, initiatives to try and Im uh, improve them and hopefully lower the impact as we go forward in time. So the concept I've given you so far is that people who are at risk for type 2 diabetes carry a predisposition often within the beta cell, something called susceptible beta cells, but then when they are exposed to a metabolic stress, they're unable to compensate to that metabolic stress, and that leads to the advent of the earliest stages of type 2 diabetes that then progresses. And so the next important research topic is, well, what are metabolic stresses that are commonly associated now with precipitating the onset of the earliest stages. Something we used to refer to when I was younger as environmental aspects of diabetes. Again, there's a fairly long list, and I think one can look at much of that list and not be surprised. These are the aspects of poor metabolism, often poor health practices, and many of the modern day changes that are occurring around us as people move into more complicated lives. And so what we're talking about is obesity, uh, high caloric, high fat diets, lack of physical activity, malnutrition, all of these are clearly associated with increasing the risk of diabetes in population studies. A big focus has occurred with modern day depression and emotional stress. And I'm not sure what you hear in your clinics here, but in my clinic, at least half of the people who walk into my clinic on a day-to-day -day basis will tell me that they're stressed out, that their life has complicated financial stresses, family stresses, work stresses, life stresses, on and on, it seems to be a dominant part of their lives. Poverty is also in low economic status, not surprisingly for a variety of reasons. A big focus has occurred in the last five to 10 years related to sleep disorders, and I think it's a common scenario now in any diabetes clinic to talk about the possibility of sleep apnea the same way that any sleep clinic uh, screens people for diabetes, usually because the association between the two is so strong. And then there's a variety of drugs which we use which uh, raise the incidence of type 2 diabetes. So when I talk to the medical students and sort of look at this list, there's no big surprises. However, the part of the list that the students like is in fact there are a number of factors which are proven, and I use the word proven, to lower the risk of diabetes, and many of them have relatively profound protective effects. And when you start to look at the list, at least in the United States, the students are happy because alcohol clearly has a protective effect. Caffeine up to three or four cups of coffee or tea per day has multiple positive health benefits, including to lower the rates of type 2 diabetes. Chocolate, it turns out it has to be good chocolate. Uh, chocolate is associated with a lower rate of diabetes when taken in uh, modest amounts. And also an interesting paper published some years ago of looking at equivalent carbohydrate intake but if it's done with brown rice versus white rice, there seem to be a, a lower risk of conversion to type 2 diabetes. The interesting thing here is we think we understand the basis for this. We don't really understand the basis for much of this. And so one really needs to continue to be humble in terms of how we think we understand the pathogenesis of this disease. And so the last thing to talk about is, well, is there anything we can actually do in terms of early intervention? The short answer to that is nothing specific because we are still lacking clear known mechanisms that we test for in any clinic setting, in any individual in terms of what might be the dominant pathogenesis for their early metabolic disruption. But there is an important series of studies that I want to talk quickly about, and that's using intensive early therapy to try and reverse glucose toxicity.
You may know this study. This is a study which has received extensive discussion in the United States, which goes back, you can see, to 2008. This is an interesting study from China and essentially taking people with new onset type 2 diabetes and it's not insignificant diabetes. One can see that they have an average hemoglobin A1C of almost 10%. The design of the trial was after the diagnosis to give them a short period of intensive blood glucose management and then stop all therapy to see what happened. So essentially the design was three subgroups. One was to treat them with oral agents, and at least in China, that was a sulfonylurea, unless the BMI was uh, 27 and above, and then they were given metformin. Given an insulin pump, in red, or given a multi-shot insulin program, and again, in this study, that was NPH and regular. And so what they were given is essentially these medicines until blood glucose values normalized, which amazingly took only two or three weeks and then all of the medication was stopped and they were followed for up to a year to see when they reverted back to hyperglycemia. The surprising thing in this study, and the reason we've talked about it so much, is there was such a high percentage of people who stayed in remission for a year after that early intervention. What you're seeing is it was best with the insulin pump and also the multi-shot insulin program, but even people who got oral agents for just a couple of weeks and everything was stopped, a quarter of them were still normally glucose tolerant a year later, reversal of glucose toxicity. And when you look at the biological basis behind that, it correlated with improvements in beta cell function. So what you see is that when they were first diagnosed, beta cell function was horrible, at the end of the two or three week treatment, there was a huge improvement in beta cell function, reversal of glucose toxicity, and even a year later in the people who remained in remission, there was still pretty good beta cell function, telling you that the early stages of beta cell defects are not structural or permanent. Many of them are acquired related to the onset of the poor metabolic effects of early diabetes. It's not unique to this one study. There are multiple studies of using early intensive insulin therapy in people who are newly diagnosed, typically for quite short periods of time, often in patients from Asia, which may be important in the pathogenesis of this disease. And again, interestingly, a very high incidence of attained euglycemia and a surprising incidence of maintenance of euglycemia off all therapy a year later. So it's, it's not unique to that one study. This appears to be a real effect. So ladies and gentlemen, this is what I've tried to tell you as I've thought about uh, this and presented my talk today. Uh, in terms of type 2 diabetes, even in the face of profound insulin resistance, which clearly uh, is increasingly becoming endemic in our two populations, if you happen to have healthy beta cells, that's a pretty good thing in terms of prevention of diabetes. And beta cells are amazingly adept at uh, maintaining normal glucose concentrations uh, in that situation. If you work with obese patients who are going for bariatric surgery, at least half of them are normally glucose tolerant at the time of surgery despite profound uh, incidence of uh, insulin resistance. If you have susceptible beta cells and are now exposed to a variety of metabolic stresses which also are, are becoming endemic around us, then what happens is you have imperfect compensation, uh, the earliest stages of type 2 diabetes, the onset of the acquired abnormalities of glucose toxicity, uh, toxicity, and then entering the slow evolution to what we think of as typical type 2 diabetes and its natural progression. That's something then called the two-hit hypothesis. You need susceptible beta cells, and you need the advent of environmental issues which tend to bring out the susceptibility so you can't compensate, and then this whole sequence starts. So what then is the future? I think the goal for the future, as we really think about interventions to try and make a big impact on this epidemic around the world, is one, we need biomarkers to pick out the earliest stages of this disease, long before blood glucose values become abnormal. Biomarkers of abnormal beta cell function, but also of abnormal insulin sensitivity. We need proven 
to know what those defects are with specific therapies targeted against them uh, and successful intervention strategies. My guess is what's what the future will be uh, probably long after I'm retired. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jack, for a nice descriptive lecture of the impact of the gene as well as the environment in the pathogenesis of diabetes mellitus.